Good morning, and uh, welcome to our Farmer Wellness Webinar Series with Kathy Summers. Um, today, Kathy will be talking to us about how to get better sleep. Thank you very much, and a warm welcome to everybody. We all know that sleep can give us a lot of great things. Energy helps us learn, helps us think, it restores us. I'm wondering though, as we're approaching harvest season, if you are sometimes staying up later to get more work done, are you aware that if you stay up for more than 17, 18, 19 hours continuously being awake, that your level of judgment and thinking is as impaired as if you had a blood alcohol level of 0.08%. The police would pull you off the road if they found that you were at this level because it has such a significant impact on our ability to function well. So as we're approaching harvest season, I want to ask you to think about the hours that you are sleeping and as much as possible to protect your sleep time. We know that there's a zone of vulnerability. People who have a number of hours continuously being awake like that will be much more prone to having accidents. In fact, 2 a.m. is when there are the most accidents in North America. So the remedy for this debt, the only remedy is sleep. Having caffeine, keeping the window open, singing songs are not fully capable of restoring and re preventing us from having these negative declines. The most current sleep research is suggesting for our physical health, ideally we'd have at least six and a half to seven hours every night. And the most recent movement after the last sleep conference in the United States was to aim for a hard eight. If I could be in bed for about eight hours, hopefully I would be asleep for about seven and a half of those hours. I do want you to be aware that it won't be like that every night. Maybe it is harvest season. Maybe I have a cold or there's other things going on in my life that are very stressful. And I'm just not able to sleep even if I am in bed. The good news is that our brain, our body has a catch up mechanism with sleep. It's gonna try very hard to catch us up. So most of my clients actually are spending about seven to eight hours in bed at night. They know that sleep is important their greatest challenge is maybe they're trying too hard. Are you someone who takes a long time to fall asleep once you are in bed? Or do you wake up in the middle of the night and it seems to take forever to get back to sleep? Or maybe you wake up really early in the morning and there's time for more sleep, but you can't get back to sleep then. Are you a person who says from the hours I'm sleeping, I don't think I'm getting the amount of energy I should from the hours that I am asleep. If you've answered yes to any of these questions, you meet the definition of insomnia. Insomnia is taking a long time to fall asleep or to fall back to sleep or not getting much energy from our sleep. These are the things that I wanted to talk to you about today. We know that there are three keys to really decreasing insomnia beyond this general information of making sure that I'm looking after my health. Because if I have anxiety, depression, pain, if I'm a person who is angry when I'm getting to bed, grandma was right. All of these things do have an impact on my sleep. I'd like to make sure that I'm physically active during the day and that I have a comfortable bed, a comfortable mattress, that it's dark, that it's quiet, we also know from sleep research that if I'm lying in bed for prolonged periods of time awake, for example, I wake up at 5.30, the alarm isn't going to go off till 7 or 7.30, but I just lie there thinking about the day that's coming up or maybe reviewing things that have been going on over the past few weeks or worrying, that if I'm awake for all these hours in bed, that actually changes what's going on with my sleep and tends to erode it. So if you realize I'm awake in bed. From past experiences, the chances are that I'm really not going to get to sleep within the next half hour. Get out of bed and do something else. And then if it's the middle of the night, then get back in bed when you're calm. 
and see if sleep will overtake you again. So we want to curtail the time that we are awake in bed. In addition to these pieces of general information that most people know, there are three keys to really decreasing insomnia. These three keys, can I relax my body when I'm in bed? It's been found that people having trouble with sleep tend to tighten up their muscles as they're approaching their bed and their heartbeat is going faster. Maybe they're thinking about how long is it going to take to get to sleep tonight or how tired am I going to be tomorrow? Can you see thinking like that might make it harder for me to fall asleep? So I want to relax my body in bed and I also want to relax my brain in bed. For most of my clients, this is their nemesis. They just want to find the off switch how to settle down that busy brain. They know if they could calm that, they would be able to sleep. And finally, if I could follow certain sleep strengthening behaviors, Dick Bootson was one of the pioneers in sleep research. He elucidated a list of behaviors for people to follow. If you've done any reading about sleep in books or on trusted websites, or if you've talked to health professionals, they've probably given you this list of behaviors. Combining these three keys, which really are the three B's because they all start with the letter B. I want to relax my body, relax my brain, and do certain behaviors to improve my sleep. These are very effective. In fact, more effective than sleeping pills in the long run. Research tells us that it may take some time. So that's the drawback to doing this kind of training over the medications. Funnily enough, sleep is considered a behavior, a behavior of our brains and our bodies. And if you've ever tried to change a behavior, maybe you've made a New Year's resolution. I'm going to eat more nutritiously. I'm going to be more physically active. I'm going to not procrastinate so much. Maybe you found that... It's more than just making the resolution. In fact, we know that you have to stick with it for at least 28 to 35 days before it's become more of a habit that you probably will continue with this behavior. So it's very interesting to me that the sleep researchers find exactly the same thing with these three keys, that we need to practice them every day or every night for at least three to four weeks before we might see some of the gains. So I'm going to ask you to do something that's really hard to improve your sleep. Could you try what we're about to talk about for at least one month before making any judgment calls? The human brain is very judgmental. We want to wake up tomorrow and feel like we're making progress. And the next morning, more progress and more progress and more progress. I'm asking you to suspend that. It's going to be an up and down, bumpy road. So many things impact our sleep. Stuff that's going on during the day. Knowing that tomorrow there's a big event. I have to go to court. Or I have to give a presentation. Or I'm getting married. Or Santa Claus is coming tomorrow. All these things will impact my sleep. So I need to be really strong with my three keys. To be able to have the best chance of success in the face of all my life events. And understanding the things coming at me tomorrow. So if you try all the things that we talk about right now, while you're working through today and into tonight, and wake up tomorrow and say, well, that didn't work. Obviously, Kathy doesn't know what she's talking about. You haven't tried it long enough. First recommendation then, can you give this an experiment for one month before making any judgment calls? The handouts that you've downloaded have a lot of this information in them. In fact, they list all of Dick Bootson's sleep behaviors. I'm not going to highlight them all because you can read as well as I can. But what I did want to talk about today was the behavior of talking to yourself and the clock. Bootson said, don't look at the clock. Now, why did he recommend that? Most people, when they're looking at the clock, are talking to themselves inside their head. They might be doing math, saying there's three more hours before the alarm goes off and I have to get up and start my day. 
There's two more hours. There's one more hour. And obviously, I'm doing math. My brain is not resting. But the other thing that might be going on is that I may be trying hard. I might be looking at the clock saying, I've got to fall asleep right now. I've got to get a lot of energy to be out there on the farm and doing the harvest. I've got to sleep without these awakenings. I've got to sleep for eight hours. I've got to, got to, got to. This is the tyranny of the shoulds or the musts or the got tos, like a tyrant. Our brain, our body, when they hear these demanding, carved in stone words, I should, I have to, I've got to, now, all, will say, wow, that sounds really important. Hey, I know exactly what to do to meet this challenge and demand to get that job done, release adrenaline, because it sounds so important. But you know what adrenaline does. Adrenaline pumps us up and it makes our brain race. Research is telling us it will take three times longer to fall asleep or to fall back to sleep if I'm saying that I have got to sleep, fill in the blank. So my second recommendation after cutting yourself some slack and trying to experiment for a month is to stop looking at the clock and stop demanding that sleep happens right now. In fact, I am encouraging you to change your goal. From tonight onwards, your goal is not sleep. In case you're one of these people who's been saying, I have got to sleep, fill in the blank. Unconsciously, you're trying too hard, releasing adrenaline, pushing sleep away. So now you're wondering, what is my goal? as I'd love to have a great sleep tonight. Your goal in bed is to rest. If you can rest your brain and rest your body, that sets the stage for sleep to overtake us. Have you ever fallen asleep in front of the TV or reading the newspaper or in a boring meeting or in church? In these situations, I know that you're not saying to yourself, I've got to fall asleep right here and now. You're probably saying, oh, after the day I've had today? Wow, it's so nice to sink down into this chair and be entertained by this mindless show and just rest and do nothing. Or in that meeting, I'm just going to rest my eyes for just a minute. And when we're resting, especially the more hours that we've been awake, there'll be more biological push to push us to sleep. If I rest... So this is the real skill. The skill is how to rest my brain and rest my body in bed. Now, some of my clients say they are resting in bed. But as we talk a little bit more, we realize because they're sedentary, they think that they're resting. But really, while they're lying down there, they're thinking about all the things that have to be done tomorrow or they're worrying, or they're reviewing things. They're not resting in their mind. They're thinking, judging, analyzing. Their brain is at work. So to really get a good quality sleep, it's thought that about 50% will be coming from resting our brain and slowing down our brainwave speed. And 50% of the resting will be resting our body letting go of those tight muscles, slowing our breathing, our heart rate, letting our blood pressure settle down. To get that brain to relax, you've probably heard it said that blue light may be interfering, and they're right. On a number of different levels, it may be impairing our ability to fall asleep. All light signals the brain to be alert. Blue light in particular also prevents the release of melatonin, which is our own brain chemical that promotes sleep. And the other thing about blue light is it stops our brain from slowing down into the slow pace called the theta brainwave pattern, which is the pre-sleep state where we're drifting in and drifting out before we really get more deeply asleep. And so for these reasons, it is recommended that we would turn off all devices and screens before bed. 
for many years, they've been saying about an hour before bed, we want to turn off these screens. More recently, I've heard some of the researchers say maybe an hour and a half before bed. Now, currently they're not so worried about TV screens. If you're sitting at the appropriate distance away from TV screens, they're really thinking more about our tablets, our phones, our computers that may be much closer to our eyes. So to work with this, if you're one of these individuals, like some students that I have, who say the last thing that they do before they close their eyes when their head is on the pillow is they check one more time to see if any messages have come through on their phone. If you think this would be really hard to turn off your devices an hour, an hour and a half before bed, the way to do it is called the screen diet. 10 minutes before bed, turn off these devices, put them on charge in another room that is not your bedroom and give yourself that 10 minutes for your brain to start settling down and resting. Maybe doing some routine in the house, or making sure the doors are locked, fluffing your pillow, putting on your pajamas, brushing your teeth, washing your face, doing your bedtime routine. After a few days when you're used to this, that 10 minutes before bed, there's no screens. Now you do it 20 minutes before bed, put them on charge in another room. And for 20 minutes, calm your mind before you get into bed, doing more neutral, at ease tasks. After a few days, at 20 minutes, then you increase it to 40 minutes. When you're used to that after a few days, then 50, 60 minutes, etc. So now you're more comfortable having this time for your mind to start resting well before you get into bed. We don't want to wait till we're in bed to really start resting. One of the things you'll see on the list of boots and strategies is to calm down for half an hour or more before bed. So avoid having those telephone calls that get you really worked up. Avoid doing a lot of work that is very emotional. Do more calming things prior to bed. If you went to the sleep lab and slept there all night long, where they're looking to see if you've got any disorders regarding sleep. They monitor many different parameters. Are you tight in your jaw? Are you kicking with your legs? How much warm blood and oxygen is flowing into your fingers? And then the hallmark about what's really happening, brainwave monitors. If they were to summarize the entire night of what was happening with the brainwave response, it would look like this diagram that I would start off and I'm awake. I go into stage one sleep, which is a very light level of sleep. In fact, we actually are thinking in the lighter levels of sleep, explaining why when some people are in the sleep lab and the next morning say to the doctor, you know, I only slept four hours last night here in the lab. The doctor will say, I was just looking at that trace. You slept six hours. What's the discrepancy there? It's because you were asleep clinically, you probably didn't think you were asleep because it was a light stage and you were maybe aware that you were thinking. After these light levels of sleep, we start going into the deeper and deeper levels. Stage three and stage four are very deep. I'm sleeping through the thunderstorm and pretty well everything else doesn't affect me at all. I've got no idea it's happening. More recently, they're not calling it stage three and stage four. They're calling it slow wave sleep because it's much more descriptive of the brainwave pattern that's happening. This slow wave stage of sleep is super energizing. Every stage of sleep gives us energy, but this slow wave stage is like a superpower recharge, like we are batteries that have plugged into the wall. Many of my clients say, I want more of that. I really want to make sure that when I'm sleeping, I'm getting the most energizing stages. That's where I'm going. If you'll just bear with me a minute. I want to just finish up these stages by saying, you can see that after going through these light stages and then getting into the deep slow wave stage, that then we've got the black bar, REM sleep. Our brain is very active, but chemicals are released, so we're not acting out this because REM stands for rapid eye movement. We are dreaming. Dreaming tends to help us lay things into long-term memory. 
if I've been trying to learn a new computer program, a new dance move, um, something new on the farm with some machinery. The slow, uh, the REM sleep, rapid eye movement, also seems to help us handle stress better the next day. So it'll roll more off us like water off a duck's back. So every stage gives us something vital. After having some of the dreaming, we tend to go through the stages again. In fact, as you look at this diagram, you see we're cycling through light and deep stages of sleep, light and deep, light and deep. If you look much more closely, you'll see that the energizing slow wave sleep is banked in the first half of the night and the dreaming is predominant in the last half of the night. So the first few hours of our sleep are often called core sleep. And many people might wake up after they've had their core sleep. In fact, if you look at the diagram, you can see that we're changing stages very frequently throughout the night, from one stage to another, from one dream to another. In fact, everybody wakes up two or three times every hour all night long. Did you hear what I just said? Everybody wakes up two or three times every hour all night long. But usually it's so fleeting that we just move right into the next stage, right into the next dream, without realizing we were awake, unless we're awake for more than five minutes. So if you go to your doctor or a sleep specialist to say, doctor, I've got a problem because I'm waking up in the night, the doctor would look at you and say, so what? Everybody wakes up two or three times every hour all night long. Waking up is a part of sleep. It's not a problem. It's not like it's a vital continuous function that should not be chopped up or interrupted. Naturally in itself, it's very dynamic. There's lots of things going on and waking up is part of sleep. So the sleep doctor would look at you and say, if you're waking up in the night, our goal is to be able to get back to sleep within about 30 minutes. And we'll talk, be talking about how to do this in just a few minutes. But I really want to make this point that it is normal to wake up through the night. Many of my clients will say, I take your point. So I'm not going to get stressed anymore about the fact that I'm waking in the night. I'm just going to tell myself this is normal. I'll set the stage for sleep to overtake me by resting. But you know, Kathy, it didn't happen when I was younger. And actually part of me is still bugged by this. I really would like to decrease these awakenings if possible. And if that is you, then I'm gonna refer you to one of the other handouts that you can download where the title says Midnight Awakenings. I've made a list of the most common factors that might make us wake up through the night. Very briefly, most of them have to do with chemical levels in our body. For example, if my iron levels are low, I'm at a greater risk of waking in the night. If I'm under a lot of stress and my body's released stress chemicals, and especially the chemical cortisol, that will wake me through the night. And if I'm a person who's diabetic, pre-diabetic, hypoglycemic, or if you're like me, I get peckish in the middle of the afternoon. The fluctuation of those blood sugar levels, that could happen in the night and it could wake us up. That's why many dietitians will recommend that we have a snack before we go to bed. They're not saying a big meal. They do not want heavy, fatty, spicy foods to be eaten, but they're thinking about a light snack. And most commonly they're recommending that you'd have a little bit of protein with some carbohydrate. Their most common example is to have some milk with cereal or to have some yogurt and fruit, to have some cheese and crackers. A light snack before bed can help stabilize our blood sugars. So you can look through this list later and see if there's any factors there that you might be able to mitigate and might be able to decrease the number of awakenings through the night. In fact, it's really heartening to read there that people who follow Dick Bootson's recommended behaviors often do begin decreasing the number of awakenings in the night. In fact, when I do my Better Sleep program, where we meet five times, I usually find at least 50% of the people who say their trouble is waking in the night will say in the last class that they are noticing a shift, there are fewer awakenings, and it's much quicker for them to get back to sleep. It always amazes me that even within a month's time, people can begin to see this shift 
even if it's been happening for weeks, months, years. So again, our first experimental period is for one month to just try and experiment to see what might happen. Before we move on, I did want to say, if you are awakening in the night, the most common reason that we are aware that we're awake is because we are uncomfortable. My bladder is full, so calmly get up and address that. Or maybe I'm hot or having a hot flash. Take off a layer and calmly address that. Maybe I'm cold because the covers got kicked off. Calmly address it by pulling the covers up. Maybe I am feeling pins and needles in one side because I've been lying on it for too long. Roll over. Or maybe I'm experiencing pain. If you have arthritis or other pain conditions, usually rolling over is not sufficient. Often the best thing, as much as we don't want to do it, would be getting out of bed and calming the pain down by doing what you found during the day works. Whether it's using a hot pack or changing your posture, doing some stretching, using your pain medication, self-massage, do what you find during the day works to settle down the pain. When the pain is starting to ease, then you get back in bed and repeat the strategies we're about to do to truly rest in bed and set the stage for sleep to overtake you. So we've been talking about sleep happens in stages. That slow wave sleep that's the superpower recharge, sometimes we don't go there. We actually only get the lighter levels of sleep. What are the thieves that rob this from us? Well, I've mentioned cortisol, a stress chemical. In addition to waking us up in the night, it also will mean that I'm not getting such a deep, restful sleep. So anything that I can do to better manage my stress would be really helpful. We put some tips in the previous webinar. You could go and you could look at that. We have two more webinars coming up, one of them specifically about anxiety, and one is about worrying. And these things may be very helpful to have some strategies during the day to decrease the stress, the cortisol release that may impair our sleep at night. There's other chemicals that prevent us from getting down to this stage. If I have alcohol within three hours of bedtime, it robs us of energizing sleep. Yes, I know they used to prescribe having a nightcap before bed if you were having trouble with sleep, but they don't do that anymore. We know that it alcohol does act initially as a central nervous system depressant and we now know that there's a rebound stimulant effect so if it's too close to bedtime it could wake me up now in addition to alcohol robbing us of energizing sleep other stimulants like caffeine do this as well it is highly recommended to have no caffeine for six hours before bed or more. That's because caffeine has a long half-life, six hours after having that coffee or tea or pop or chocolate or the medications that have caffeine in. Six hours after having it, half the caffeine is still in your system. So many sleep doctors will say, have no caffeine after lunch. Some of them will say have no caffeine after breakfast. And there's one sleep doctor in the Waterloo region who says if you're over age 50, have no caffeine at all for a one month experiment to see what impact that might be having on the awakenings in the night and the restfulness that you may be not getting from your sleep. I didn't say you'd like all the ideas that we're covering in the webinar today, but I want you to know what the sleep doctors are recommending to really try and protect our sleep. Many people are using caffeine for energy. Now, they might be using sugary treats for energy as well. And aspartame may be having an impact on our sleep. So to think about these chemicals, if we're using them for energy, Maybe you could think back to what we talked about in the previous webinar. Caffeine and sugar are considered false friends. They might promise they're going to give us all this energy. 
It's a great promise, but they turn around and they stab us in the back because they make us feel more fatigued two hours afterwards compared to if we hadn't consumed them at all. So if you're using your caffeine and your sugar for energy, my recommendation is going to be to see if you can use something else for energy. And that would be eating snacks or meals, eating every three to four hours, where it's a combination of some carbohydrates with some protein. That should fuel us and give us energy that we need. Most people are really good at getting the carbs. They're grabbing the muffin, the grains, the cereals, the fruits, the vegetables, but they're not maybe getting the protein in their snacks or in their meals that will allow them to have enough energy to last three to four more hours until it's the next time to eat where they're going to have that combo of protein with carbs. The more that you could have the energy coming from your food, the less need there will be for the caffeine. And if you could then avoid having caffeine after lunch, you may notice a very nice impact on your sleep. Other factors that rob us of this slow wave stage of sleep are things like sleep apnea, a sleep disorder where you're not breathing while you're sleeping. So obviously you don't know this is happening because you're sleeping through it. But if your partner has said that there are periods where you're not breathing, or if you're feeling totally exhausted all the time, and you don't think it's from other health conditions or other things in life, that is something to do with sleep, not getting a good quality sleep, and you've addressed all the other factors we've talked about, then perhaps you have sleep apnea. This is why sleep labs have sprung up across North America. They're trying to assess mostly if people have sleep apnea because it robs them of this energizing stage of sleep. So much so that after a number of months or years, they're at great risk of drifting off. And if this happens during the day in a meeting, maybe that's not a problem. In front of the TV, it's not a problem. But if it's happening while you're working on the tractor, while you're driving your, your product to the elevator or to the marketplace, this is dangerous, Impairing, imperiling maybe not only your own life, but other people. We also know that people with sleep apnea are at much greater risk for cardio health, cardiovascular health problems. Canadian research has told us that chemicals are released during the apnea that impact our cardiovascular health. And so for good health and to not be falling asleep when it's totally inappropriate, we want to address the apnea. If you suspect that you've got this, right after this webinar, you're going to make that phone call to your doctor saying, I want to come and talk about my sleep. They'll do a quick screening to see if you should go to the lab and have a test for it. The only way to you truly know if you've got sleep apnea is by going to the sleep lab. Another thing that robs us of this energizing stage of sleep is having naps, long naps. Bootsen, that was a long time ago, he thought maybe it's not a good idea to have naps because it might make it harder for us to fall asleep at night. More current studies are telling us it actually may be a good idea to have naps. In fact, for at least 10% of the population, it may be a good idea to nap every day, regularly. When I was growing up on the farm, we would have our lunch, then we would have a 20 minute nap, and then we would go out and we'd work for the rest of the day. Maybe that's your lifestyle. It's actually highly recommended to do something like this if you're a person who can nap and seem to get something from it. Not everybody can nap. The problem is that if I'm having a nap during my day and I'm asleep for more than half an hour, I'm starting to get some slow wave sleep during my nap in the daytime, which means that at night, when I start to go through the sleep cycles and my brain is approaching that slow wave stage of sleep, my brain's going to say, actually, a few hours ago in the afternoon, I had some slow wave sleep during my nap. Oh, been there, done that, don't need to do that now. And we'll have no slow wave sleep all night long. Explaining why some people will say, I didn't feel like I got any energy while I was sleeping last night, so I really need to have a nap today. And they nap for an hour two hours or three hours, they're getting all of their slow wave sleep during the day. That's why it doesn't feel restful at night. If you want to feel that energy from your bedtime sleep, 
nap during the day for short periods. It may mean setting the alarm so that you're not getting too deeply asleep, that you are waking up before you get into the slow wave stage. If it's harvest and it has been 17 hours, 18 hours that you've been awake and you really do need to work a number of more hours before it rains, then I would recommend that you take a nap, set a timer, ask somebody to phone you, do it so that you're not totally comfortable, uh, that your seat, your back is not supported in the chair, in the tractor, in the vehicle, and have a short nap. We know that even a five minute nap will be a bit restorative and help with the thinking, the judgment, that if you feel you do have to continue working, you will be safer because you did have a little bit of sleep. Ideally though, we want to really protect our sleep time and not be awake 19 continuous hours. You'll be able to read about many of these factors that rob us of the energizing slow wave sleep on the handout that has this diagram. So we've covered these things. Uh, well, the ones that I didn't talk about would be things like pain, reflux, stress and anxiety. A busy brain might prevent ourselves from getting into the deepest levels of sleep. I cannot stress enough the ability to calm our mind before we get into bed and when we're in bed. If you have children, when they were babies, if you said to yourself, I have to keep one ear open in case the baby cries tonight, you were saying to yourself, do not get into the slow wave stage of sleep. Did you unlearn that? When they're old enough, you want to teach those children, it's their responsibility to come and wake you up if there's something that they need your help with, that they would come and they would tug on your arm or they would scream in their ear that would wake you up. So you don't have to keep one ear open, continue listening for them all night long. That will allow you to get the most deep sleep. So how do we settle down our brain? How do we truly rest our brain and body before bed? Many of my clients have no idea how to do this. And so I recommend a comprehensive approach, the BMW approach, to remember some key concepts to think about when you're in bed. First base is be breathing. Slow down your breathing. Because just before we drift off, our breathing does slow down. You might have tried breathing when you were in bed already and find that your mind wanders off a lot. That's the problem with breathing. But it's a really good idea to slow it down for half a minute or a minute, however long you can focus on it, so that your brain will start to slow down and your body will start to slow down. If we slow down to get to the real sweet spot of slow breathing, we kick in a parasympathetic nervous system response. That's the part of our nervous system that calms, heals, restores, and rests us. And remember, our goal is to rest in bed. So slow breathing peacefully is helpful. Second base is M muscles, letting go of tension in the muscles. We've touched on that before. I come from a science background. So I'd say to get the biggest bang for our buck, let's really work on resting the muscles around our jaw and our eyes. Because proportional to the rest of the muscles in our body, there are so many more nerves from these muscles inputting into the sensory motor cortex of our brain. Such that if I'm in bed thinking about all the things that bugged me during the day, thinking about things we don't like, we tend to tighten our jaw. And then our brain's going to get the message those muscles are tight and our brain will stay very active. If I'm playing a mini movie in my mind about what I'm going to be doing to get through the work day tomorrow, playing it all out in my mind, that little mini movie will also keep my brain very active. If I could rest my eyes, rest my jaw, then even my brain will start relaxing. So I'm getting a two for one deal here. I'm not only resting my body when I relax the muscles, if I'm resting my eyes and my jaw, I'm starting to rest that busy brain. 
for those of us who say that is their greatest challenge. After slowing my breathing and resting my jaw and eyes and maybe other muscles, if that feels comfortable to me, then third base is W. W stands for warm, letting the warm blood flow back to my hands and back to my feet. Because part of our stress response, that fight, flight, freeze mechanism, is saying this is a stressful situation. I don't need good circulation in my fingers and my toes and around my stomach. Send the blood to the big muscles in my arms in case I need to fight right now. Send the blood to the big muscles in my legs in case I need to run and kick right now. So a sign that I'm relaxing and truly resting is the blood goes back to my fingers and my toes and my stomach. So I'm truly resting and digesting. And if I'm in bed and I've got blankets over my body, I might actually start to feel that it's getting more warm and cozy underneath the blankets. Are you one of these people who doesn't want to get out of bed because it's so warm and comfortable? That warm coziness, just thinking about being warm, starts calming our mind and calming our body. So doing the combination of breathing, muscles, and letting the warm blood flow to the extremities is extremely helpful at calming ourselves. So let's try a short BMW. So you've got an idea of what I'm talking about. Just before we do that though, I'm wondering if you're one of these people who wakes up in the night, what's the first thing you say to yourself when you realize you're awake and it's still dark outside? It's obviously not time to get up. Some people tell me, they say, I've got to get out of bed and go to the bathroom. But most of my folks say, I say, well, as soon as they're aware they're awake, their first thought is, oh, shoot, darn shucks, or maybe stronger language than that, that they would never say out loud to me. Or maybe they're saying, oh, not again. Do I sound like I'm calm and resting? No. You can hear it's not just words. There's emotion here. I am frustrated with the fact that I'm awake. Or I'm angry. Or I'm anxious. How long is it going to take to get back to sleep? How tired am I going to be during the day? It's a big day tomorrow. Unfortunately, if I'm really emotional, it pushes sleep even further away. So it's not just watching for saying, have I got to get to sleep now? But am I emotional? Am I swearing? Am I saying, oh, not again, feeling frustration or anger or anxiety? We really need to settle these down if we're expecting sleep to come back or to fall asleep in the first place in bed. So our goal is to rest our mind, our emotions, and our body. Let's try a brief experiment with that so you know what I'm coaching my clients to do in my Better Sleep program. Take a moment right now to close your eyes or half close your eyes looking downwards at a spot on the floor so you're not distracted by seeing things on the screen or looking at me, that you really are turning your attention inwards. And as you're turning your attention inwards, mentally scan from your head to your toe and get comfortable. The first thing that we do when we get into bed is readjust our position and our pillow and the blankets and get comfortable. So do that right now. And if it helps to remove your glasses, to loosen your belt, to kick off your shoes, Make those changes so you're as comfortable as you can be. And as you're getting more and more comfortable, this is new. Say to yourself, how nice it is to just rest. What a pleasure after being active earlier today to be able to smooth my face and let my mind rest. How nice it is to relax my shoulders and my back it is sink down into this chair and let my body rest. Brains and bodies are built to work and rest. Work and rest. It's part of our natural rhythm. Just like there's a rhythm for the sun to come up and the sun to go down. There's a rhythm to planting the crops and then harvesting the crops. There is a rhythm to work 
and rest. It's even legislated into Canadian workplaces that we can work and then have a coffee break to rest, work and then have a lunch break, because we know human brains and bodies thrive if we take a break and rest and then go back to work again. How nice it is right now to take a short break and just rest. But I bet even as I'm talking, thoughts are coming into your mind because this is normal brain behavior. When we switch away from work mode in our brain, we move to rest mode, which literally is called the default mode network, meaning it is a network of connections. Explaining why when we're in rest mode, all of a sudden we connect with that name that was on the tip of our tongue earlier and we couldn't think of it, now we're thinking of it. It comes to us. Or aha, there's the solution to a problem that's been on my mind. Or aha, a creative idea. Aha, another connection. This is normal brain behavior when we start resting. And it's going to happen every night when we are in bed. The key is to acknowledge that this is coming in. And rather than getting into these thoughts, thinking them, working them, moving along that path, acknowledging that that's something we're aware of and coming back to just resting our breathing, our muscles, the warm blood circulating, resting more. Right now, if there are extraneous thoughts coming into your mind, can you vividly imagine you take all those thoughts and put them away in your closet with all the clothes that you're not wearing right now. Vividly imagine how it would look, how it would feel, how it would sound to put all those thoughts away in the closet, maybe even closing the door on them, keeping them safe. And as you're putting all those thoughts away safely in the closet, get out of your head and get into your body. Take a breath in. Hold it for a second in your chest. Notice that. Feel your chest. Feel the breath. Then exhale and feel the tensions going out with the air. And as you're aware of your breathing, Allow it to move into an easy, normal pattern. Calmly, comfortably breathing in. Slowly, comfortably breathing out. Allowing it to slow down. More and more slowly breathing in. More and more slowly breathing out. Moving towards that slow, peaceful pace that you have just before you drift off. Slowly, comfortably breathing in. Peacefully, slowly breathing out. Continuing breathing in this fashion. When the mind wanders, it's time to move on. Noticing now your jaw. Gently make a very light tension. Comfortably press your teeth together just a little bit. Tighten your jaw. Press your tongue a little bit against the roof of your mouth. Press your lips into a flat line. Feel where you can hold some tension in your jaw area. Many people hold tension like this when they're in bed. They're thinking about things. Become familiar with this tension as you're noticing it. Let it go. Switch off, like switching off a light. Teeth apart, release any pressure from the tongue, relaxing your jaw, your neck, your shoulders. And with each breath out, tell it to relax even more, right into the heart of those muscles. As your jaw continues relaxing more, 
Notice your eyes. Make a gentle tension, closing your eyes just a little bit more, a light squint. We use our eyes a lot during the day. Switch off. Tell it to switch off even more with each breath out, smoothing your eyes and behind your eyes, smoothing your face and your jaw and your neck and your shoulders. Each breath out, relaxing your face even more. And if you like what we've been doing with the muscles, then when you're on your own in bed, you could do other muscles. You could do your forehead, your shoulders, your upper arms and lower arms and hands, your trunk, your upper legs, your lower legs, your feet, a gentle tension and then release, moving from your head to your toe, just resting more. With each breath out, think about your forehead smoothing more. With each breath out, imagine your eyes smoothing more. With each breath out, letting your jaw relax even more. With each breath out, imagining your shoulders warm and comfortable, saying over and over in your mind calmly, my shoulders are comfortably warm. Without analyzing, judging, or thinking about whether it's happening, just occupy your mind by calmly saying, my shoulders are comfortably warm. Calmly repeating over and over, hitting the replay button. My arms are comfortably warm. My arms are comfortably warm. My legs are comfortably warm. When the mind wanders, that's normal brain behavior. When it's in the default mode network, connecting to other thoughts, Simply let those thoughts go, put them away in the closet and come back to saying, my legs are comfortably warm. And on and on you could go. If you were in bed on your own, repeating, doing a bit of B, breathing, slowing it down. A bit of M, muscles, letting go of tensions, especially around the eyes and the jaw. A bit of W, warm, letting the arms and legs release tensions and the warm blood flowing to the extremities. Aware of how nice and cozy and warm it feels underneath the blankets. Or remembering a time when you were warm in the hot tub or warm sunshine. You could repeat BMW two times in a row or three times in a row becoming more and more profoundly at rest each subsequent time. It's a skill, like riding a bicycle, playing the piano, driving the tractor with all those gears. The more you practice, the better you get at it. Remembering we practice for at least a month before we make any judgment call on these strategies. Right now, it's not actually time for us to fall asleep in the webinar, so finish up what we've been doing allowing your body to remain relaxed and comfortable, but mentally more alert, more aware, feeling the cool air coming in. Each cool breath brings in energy, vigor, vitality. As the cool air comes in, feel that energy coming into your arms, your legs, arms and legs more light, more firm, more strong. And as you're tuning into them, wiggle your fingers a bit, wiggle your toes, open your eyes, stretch out fully, completely alert and ready to continue on with the rest of the webinar. 
How did that feel? Resting, brain and body, letting go of everything else for a short break, especially resting our breathing, our muscles and our circulation. Perhaps you did rest the body and could feel that, or your mind settled down and could feel that, but maybe not because it may be one of those days where you're wired. It does take time and training. If this realm is totally new to you, I would recommend that you would train BMW a few times during the day so you know how it feels and can more comfortably, effortlessly do it when you're in bed. Like breaking in a new glove, do it a little bit during the day before in bed. And if you want to follow up more seriously with this, you could go to my website. The contact information is on your handouts. And I do have an audio track, 27 minutes of bedtime relaxation, going much more into what we just did. If you think this would be something comfortable to follow up on. To sum up, we've talked today about some good lifestyle habits that we know can really improve sleep and focused on the three keys to specifically decreasing insomnia. If I could rest my brain in bed, rest my body in bed and do some of Dick Bootson's very specific behaviors, which are on your handout, I'm going to have a much greater chance of success. The bottom line, it's never what you know, it's going to be what you do. I want you to think right now about what we've talked about so far that you could practice or begin implementing. Choose one or two or maybe at the outset three things that you would work on over the next week. So if I'm trying to change 10 things, at the same time, we tend to be unsuccessful. So if something made sense that I want to do, one, two, or perhaps three things that I would like to try, ask yourself right now, what when, where would I do it within the next 48 hours? Because chances are that if you don't do it within 48 hours, you're not going to do it at all. Now that you've set that intention, it's going to be easier for you to follow through. Now let's see, are there any questions? Um, well, I, I actually have a question from mm -hmm. Kathy. So um, you say when you're going to bed, you know, keep the bed for sleep. Mm -hmm. But what about reading? Do you recommend reading before sleep or is that something you should avoid also? This is an excellent question. It seems so conflicting when you read books or read things on the internet. The older research suggested that you should not do this. Dick Bootson was very, very strict. Now, current research is saying maybe it doesn't matter so much. Here's how I think about this question. We're born with our sleep-wake rhythm. And some people are born with a really strong sleep-wake rhythm. And so they will never come to a webinar like this because they'll say, you just close your eyes and sleep. What are you talking about? But some people are born with that sensitive sleep-wake rhythm. And the more sensitive your sleep-wake rhythm is, the more important it is to really protect your sleep. So if you've got that really sensitive sleep-wake rhythm, just getting a new pillow makes it hard for you to sleep for a week. Having something making you angry during the day, impairing your sleep, then maybe it would be a good idea not to read in bed. We really want to associate our bed as a place to rest, to sleep, for sex or when we're sick, and that's it. But if we're sort of more in the middle with this, then some of the current research out of Glasgow is suggesting if reading or watching TV or other Sudoku puzzles, crossword, et cetera, if you're doing these in bed and they're calming you, and you can get to sleep easily after that, maybe they're helping you close your day and move past that. So my real answer is it depends. If it's calming you, it seems to help. But if you're saying I'm reading because I'm reading to fall asleep and you're after reading one page saying, did that work? No, I'm still awake. Reading the next page, are my eyes heavy yet? Nope. Reading the next page, am I feeling tired yet? Nope. If reading is a tool to make you fall asleep, no. It's not helpful. So that's why I recommend people keep a diary, that they'll try an experiment and try to see, are they trying too hard or are they really finding things that rest brain and body? Even in bed, it may be okay to read. You try it. 
It's really interesting that depending on how you sleep, it, yeah. it could help or hurt. Yes. Yeah. So we do have a question, and the question says, Kathy, do you have any tips on how to deal with your partner being a restless sleeper or cutting into your sleep? That's very challenging because they are interfering with your sleep. And the more sensitive your sleep-wake rhythm is, uh, the more easily disturbed your sleep is, it will impact you. There's no easy answer for this. Many sleep doctors would say it may be better to get one of those mattresses where you've got your side and they've got their side. And if that's too expensive for you, that you would sleep in a different room or on a different bed, that you truly protect your sleep time. But some of my clients say, psychologically, they want to sleep with their partner. They want to be with them. So I cannot tell you what to do with that. You want them to have the least restless sleep possible, but it's a fallacy that we should sleep without moving. We do move to adjust and get more comfortable, totally unconsciously. We may move four to 40 times in a night just to get more comfortable. And some people have sleep disorders where they might be kicking their legs and that may be disruptive to you getting kicked all the time. I'm really not sure it's a good when you're both calm <laughs> and well-fed to talk about the fact that their sleep is impacting your sleep and see if you can come up with some strategies. Yeah, that's, that's a difficult thing to to yeah. um, to deal with, I'm sure. You can't control other people. Yeah, the person, exactly. the one you can control the best is yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't look like we have any other questions. So I think that would be the end of our webinar today. Please, um, everybody stay tuned for the next one, October 2nd. We will be talking about anxiety. And if you've got more questions about sleep, you've got my contact information. So don't hesitate to give me an email or give me a phone call. Great. And again, all, if you want to rewatch this or you want to recommend to somebody else to watch it, please go to the Grain Farmers of Ontario YouTube um, page and uh, it will be put up there shortly. Thanks very much for joining today, everyone. Bye.